Start it up. Ready to play? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going down, 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 working in a coal mine. Working all day, baby, till the sun goes down. To the south, 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 the pick and shovel. I'm working all day, digging out a working town. I'm clocking in the seventy. I'm working hard still. You know, and I used to see things different. Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, and uh, joined here by a, you know, master musician, still learning, but, uh, uh, you know, a, a real artist as well. Uh, do they know what you look like and everything, Jake, because you're, do they, do you have your picture on there where they can see you? Yeah, they know me. Okay, good. Danny Barnes, welcome to the Jake <laughs> Feinberg Show, brother. Thanks, Jake. Thanks for talking to me. Absolutely, man. Um... You know, I, remember, I interviewed Bela Fleck a few years ago, and I asked him about a transcendent experience in electric jazz that, and he talked about going to see Return to Forever and realizing that the notes that Chick was playing on the piano could be replicated on the banjo. He just had to find them. And I want to know if you had a similar experience as far as the jazz inflection in your playing. Did you, did you see some of these uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra bands, or did they have an influence on you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those records were really, you know, those records were huge when they came out. They were just, back then it was just such a, you know, like when those were new records, that was just such a huge thing. It was like a bomb going off, you know. Now it's like, it's trickier now because there's so much more data, you know. But back then when there'd be a, a new record like that, it was such a heavy scene, you know. It was like you just couldn't wait for it and then you just play it like for three months straight. You just listen to one record. But pretty much uh, where, I, for me, like, I've worked quite a bit with Frizzell, Bill Frizzell, my friend Bill. And I love Bill. We caught a hang. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, I'd say, just as far as, like, mechanics and things like that and, and possibilities and stuff, I, you know, I value my time studying with Bill and stuff and working with Bill and made some records and did some touring. And well, but, but can you give an example of something that blew your mind? Uh, when you you know that had an impact on your playing specifically well, for, as it related to the I jazz. Can tell you exactly what it is is that when uh, like in like in a lot of like country and bluegrass music and stuff like that, there's these particular signposts that happen in certain bars of the form. There's you know there's eight bar forms, twelve bar forms, sixteen bar, thirty two bar forms. These like sort of building blocks, you know. And, and then there's through the re repertoire, there's places that um, are kind of like sort of like signposts for other things to happen. Dig. And they're in particular places, you know, typically. And like, but like, one time Bill came over to my house and he had a big stack of 
music probably this tall, you know, maybe it seemed like it was that tall. And as we play through all these pieces and I'm looking at his arrangements and stuff and how he does things, it's almost like everything is sort of melted, you know, like where you think something's gonna happen, nothing happens, and then where you think something wouldn't happen, there'll be something really big right there. And so hmm. I'm, that's a gross oversimplification of his uh, mise-en-scene, as it were, but nonetheless, it, it was really made an impression on me to sort through a lot of his handwritten music and see that, you know. Um, what do you mean it's harder today because there's more data? What do you mean by that? Well, it just seemed like that it, that it wasn't so hard to keep up with stuff, you know, in the old days. It seemed, it seemed like that, uh, say you had three channels on the TV and stuff like that. Seems like there's a lot of data you gotta wade through, and it's true. Like, uh, do you actually you don't spend any time doing that, right? That's not your world. Not so much. I'm mainly referring generally, I suppose, in like the general life experience. I think with folks, it's like you know, you, they before you go to bed, you're looking at your phone or your iPad, and you know, you're looking at this all this 24/7 news from all over the world, and you know, you have uh, there's just so much more things you have to kind of sort through. I think. Like, it's pretty hard to even remember what it was like when there was only three channels on TV, you know, it was a real different thing. I think it might have been, point, yeah. each, each network mm -hmm. had an orchestra and everything. It was live musicians, yeah. Yeah. How did you originally connect with uh, Dog, Gris Dog Grisman? Well, being neighbors, I suppose. Neighbors? Yeah. Down in, in, in you mean in California or in Washington? Up in Washington. Wow, yeah, no, Port uh, yeah, Washington State, hippest place in the world, man. Yeah, we live but you had not known him prior to this? No, I've, always, I've been a fan of his work since the early 70s. You know, I was really interested in what he was doing since I was a kid, you know. Because he was always... What, like, what were you interested, if you can harken back and remember what... The very first thing I heard of him was a record called Things in Live, where he played mandolin with one of my favorite banjo players, this guy Don Stover. And, uh, and it, you know, and then just being aware of him, I mean, there's so much stuff. He, his output's been incredible, you know. And it seemed like he got more and more output. And I saw him on Johnny Carson, you know, and stuff. I guess in the 70s and stuff. And, uh, I've always been aware of him since I was a young man. Wow. So how does it feel to be playing? Oh, it's unbelievable, man. It's just absolutely unbelievable. I mean, such a... I mean, I've had, I've had only just a handful of experiences to get to play with true masters of music. And the first master I ever played with was Vassar Clements when I was a teenager. Wow. I, was, I wasn't even old enough to drive. We didn't play professionally or anything, but I just got to play with him in an afternoon. And, and see, I didn't grow up in, uh, in this, you know, in the, if you grew up like in Nashville or in the Southeast or in New York or Boston or something like that or Baltimore, you, it was possible to be surrounded by these people. But for me, growing up in Texas, there wasn't that much banjo music and mandolin fiddle music. It wasn't geographically there. So you had to kind of learn it off of records. And so... Hmm. It took an extra step. Uh, whereas, like, you know, I was talking to Ron McCurry, or, or Rob McCurry, and asking about Don Reno, and he would say, well, Don was at the house, and he showed me how to do this, you know, so he had this whole access to these people hmm. direct. And I never really had that. Uh, I got but, to play the Vassar Clinton. How did that, yeah, so one day, like, at a country fair or something? Like, how did that no, happen? I, was, I had a friend, this, this dude that I used to play with was a, was a bow rehearer down in Houston, Texas, at a place called Fiddle and Bow Music off of Lily York Road and, uh, in Houston. And, and a lot of the guys, when they come through there, would uh, he would rehear their bows when they're traveling through because he was really good at it. And so Vassar uh, was there for an afternoon getting a bunch of bows rehearsed. And so... Uh, wow, we, that's we, awesome. Yeah, well, if you've never <laughs> been around a guy like that, you know, and I've been playing at that time, you know, four or five years. But I, when I started in 1971, that's all I did was play. That's all, basically all I've done since I was 10 years old, just trying to figure out. What was it about being around him? I've heard yeah. records. I've heard records of him doing, being interviewed. He says four words, and it's the most profound thing you could possibly say. Yeah, he's kind of like the opposite of me. <laughs> no, 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 no. He, I, I mean, he's, he's the opposite. I've never heard anybody uh, any, and it's such a, and it's such a, 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 a genuine. Well, those, guys, those guys, those guys, like when I'm talking about a true master of music, yeah. those guys are just like on another level. Okay, take it, break it down. I want to know that okay. this is important for the audience. Okay, well. 
there's to me this is just my little it's your show man it's not my show it's your show there's sort of a bit of a graph where you have like the true masters of music at the top and the way the universe works you only get so many at a time there's a handful of these guys four or five guys is all the universe gets it's allowed to have it's just a handful of these people and they're just they're like from another planet or from another world they, they just intergalactic yeah they have this sort of like mastery and command and they have this ability to reach people in their spirit when they play and they sort of channel this greater unity and stuff and and so anyway then there's like the craftsmen below them and there's some guys who are really really good craftsmen and then there's like people who are underneath the craft and the craftsmen are the guys who are working and putting out records and doing things and then below that you have like people that are trying to learn how to play you know, just right guys that play Vassar was in he's the a true master of music he could move people's hearts yeah, every time. Yeah, and all this music comes flying at him. You just can't even believe it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't even believe it, you know. And then so, uh, so you were like, can I, he, who off? You asked to play with him, or how did that? He was just there, and I was there with my friend that owned the store. And it was a small store about the size of this room, and and it was just a small music store. But like all the great fiddlers would come in there because this was like the dude to get to rehear your bows when you're traveling. So like a lot of those guys would come in there, but I would happen to be, in the summer I would go stay with this guy and we'd play bluegrass and listen to records and I'd work in a store. And wow. We'd just pick and basically pick all day, you know. And he had a great record collection and he was just, you know, he was very inspiring to me for music, just being obsessed with something. Exactly. Obsession. So anyway, I got uh, that was the first true master of music that I got to play with was was Vassar Clemens, and then the second master I got to play with was Chubby Wise, and I was at a bluegrass festival and he was playing there and I was a kid I think I was driving at that point I had a car, and he was playing a set and their guitar player wasn't there yet and they asked me to play with Chubby Wise and so, but just getting to play with somebody like that when you watch him. Hmm. How they hold their instrument, how they address, I call it when you have to address the instrument, you know, like you have this instrument, like if you have a banjo, you kind of got to address it, you know, like how you deal with it, mm -hmm. you know, in physical space, because it doesn't move, you can't bend it, you got to like deal with it, you know, and so how these guys address their instrument and how they, you know, how they do things and hold things and postures and their little tricks about tuning and all their little tricks and everything. You just can't get that knowledge, you know. Yeah, it has. To, it sort of has to be transmitted directly, I think. And then, like the, I think the the next person, the next master I got to play with was Ronnie Lane. And I don't know if you know who Ronnie Lane was. He was the bassist in the Faces and the Small Faces. Yeah, I think he was a. He, he he lived in Austin when I lived there, and he was a brilliant songwriter. And uh, he was he had MS. He was sick when I met him, but I had a little hmm. band with him. He was in a wheelchair and he was he was really sick, but I would go and to help him and stuff. And he, and I was really interested in him. He was a brilliant songwriter. He wrote all these songs with just two chords, you know. I don't know if you're familiar with his oeuvre. Uh, one of his songs that you probably heard is that. You know that song. It's just got two chords, and he wrote that. Yeah, he wrote it with Ronnie Wood. The voice, man. Yeah, he was really something, and he was just this amazing songwriter. Let me, I'm going to, you know, how do you, um, how have you learned over time to just, uh, you know, there's two different philosophies. You know, I've talked to cats, they don't want to be up there with a, a guitar player playing, you know, 20 minute solos and wanking it. But the question is, it's it's not wanking when you're never repeating ideas. Kenny Barron would go see Coltrane and Elvin play in the quartet, and the and the piano and bass would leave the stage, and they would trade off. It wasn't the the length of time; it was the fact that nothing was repeated. How have you learned to have always create original sequencing? Man, I haven't figured that out. I'm still trying to figure it out. It's, it's not something you're, you're even conscious of. I can't do it. Uh, yeah, to, you I did. I, saw, did. I used to saw, see Stevie Ray Vaughan for like three dollars at this place called the Rome Inn on Tuesday nights in, in Austin in the wow. '70s. It's ridiculous. Like Antones, and, he would play, and there's another place in the as an after hours club down on Congress. It was called. I forget the name of that place, but it would it would open up. You'd go in there after the other clubs would close, and he would play from like two to four or something. 
it's just unbelievable his ability as solo is unbelievable. Vassar Clements and Chubby Wise both were just unbelievable soloists. Ronnie was kind of the opposite of that, and he was more just like really fundamental, but he was just brilliant. He was brilliant with just two chords, you know. And um, all those guys never worried if you took 16 bars or 40 bars. Like you could stretch out as much as you want. Today, I just find an inclination as a Gen X, or I see younger cats wanting to wrap it up quicker. Vass or th those guys, really those hard. guys stretched, so man. Hard, man. Those guys, but they, but they, they were had, burning they had, so they hard, this, man. They had this other thing, you know. They had this other deal, you know. I don't know. I can't figure out what it is. I never. I've, I've played. I've worked with Frizzell a bunch, and he's one of those guys. Yeah. He can just play. He can just keep playing. Like if you sat up and you could just play one song, he could just play that song and never change, and it would just. It would be just amazing, you know, for a 90 minute set, he could just do one thing and you just couldn't even believe it. It's so fantastic, you know. I don't, I don't have that. I don't no, have, but I, I think, have, yeah. I've never, I've never had that. I wish I could have that, but I don't know. I'm 56 and it doesn't seem like I'm gaining on it, so I don't really know what to do, but I keep practicing. But just to go in order, let, let me go through yeah, the yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, 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 and then the next guy was Santiago Jimenez, who was a great conjunto accordionist. From when I, I grew up in Texas, you know, and you get exposed to a lot of Mexican music on the radio and and, and stuff like that, and, and growing up around not Afro-Cuban, but but mariachi kind of. No, music. no, a conjunto is a San Antonio thing. Oh, it's I don't even know what Texas. that is, dude. Well, it's like, a, did you know Flaco Jimenez? You know Flaco's mm -hmm. music. Like if you listen to his real records, like the records he made that were in Spanish for real Spanish people before he started playing more pop world. He made these records called Conjunto. It's worth looking up. It's an entire genre of music that has like this. It's amazing, you know. And uh, anyway, so I, my friend Mark Rubin, when I was in the Bad Livers, was good buddies with Santiago, and and they played together, and, and we did a couple of tours and some stuff. Where I got to really play a lot with Santiago, and he was a master accordion player, and he was one of those guys he could just play and play and play and play, and you just couldn't. There was no end to it, you know. And then. The next master I got to play with it's so beautiful. was John you, Hartford. You, you played with Hartford? Yeah. Well, he was my friend. I just would go see him. And he was, and, and I, but you know, we got to talk a lot about music, and, and, and he was really helpful to me in a lot of ways. You know. And then the next person I got to play with was probably Tim O'Brien, who is a master singer, unbelievable singer, and mandolin player, and fiddler, just an unbelievable musician. Well, I guess Frizzell would be before Tim O'Brien. After John Hartford would be Bill Frizzell and then Tim O'Brien and then uh, and then David Grissom. Um, so those are the true masters of music that I've had a chance to work with. If uh, if if you if you lost if you lost the ability to play music, would your soul die? No, I don't think so. Because I begin to see the same thing that is in music and other things. Can you give an example? Like drawing and taking pictures and writing poetry. And, uh, and things like that, and writing novels and things and books and things, I think. Very similar. Uh, um, things that would still call, yeah. 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 I'm just mechanism. talking about the cultivation yeah. of your spirit. How it, 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 well, you know. no, I could, I, I could probably, and then maybe that's why I'm not a master. I could, I could, give, I could probably give it up. Like, I, you know, I've thought about that, like if I got hurt or something like that, what would happen? And I think, you know, I enjoy, I, I never have really been interested in visual stuff. I've always just been worried about music, but I've, you know, I've, I've started it's caught your eye. drawing and paying attention more to visual things. And, and I've been messing around with the camera And I could also help people make records. Like I, I'm pretty good at messing with tape machines and stuff like that. So I can help people make records. But I don't think my soul would die in that regard. I dig. Well, I mean, um, Danny Barnes, I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, burn <laughs> it up tonight, man. It was, it, was, it was great to hang with you, brother. Thanks for okay. taking the time. You betcha, Jake. All right, man. You, man. All the best. I'll be back.